All right, guys, welcome back to the podcast. Um, I'm your host, you know that already, and um, I've got an interesting show for you today because recently Janet has gotten me into uh, bird dogs and hunting and stuff like that with the acquisition of our awesome dog, the Duanimator. So today I got a guy who's going to be on the podcast. His name is Jeremy Crisco, amazing guy, really good, good guy, southern boy, and uh, like just amazing dog trainer. And if I say he's an amazing dog trainer, you know I mean that from my heart. And we're going to talk a little bit about hunting, uh, bird dogs, what makes it up, uh, how he got into it, and stuff like that. A lot of you have asked me a lot of questions about hunting. I don't, I don't propose to know anything about it. I don't profess to know anything about it. But I, um, I got a guy who knows a lot about it, and he's very interesting. I love his style of training. I, I think he's a cool guy. Let's bring him on, Jeremy Crisco from Whistling Wings Kennels. Look, Jeremy, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks. So um, we met when uh, we got the Duanimator through you. Yes. And uh, we love Duanimator. So let's talk a little bit about, um, about bird dogs, about hunting and stuff like that. Tell, okay. me, tell me a little bit about your background first and how you got started in it and, and what, what, what you love about the sport. Okay. Um, I got started with my dad and grandfather being raised up. They trained and bred German short hairs, did a lot of uh, quail hunting. Mm -hmm. So my first experience was with that. But as I, I got older and was in high school, I got more into the duck hunting. Mm -hmm. And I was never a big, big fan of corners. Um, I was more into the labs. Mm -hmm. And so hunting through high school, training my own dog that's kind of where everything started but i guess my real passion came uh when i was in the navy and i got my first kind of well-bred labrador retriever mm -hmm. and started really researching training uh and kind of figuring out what i believed in as far as the methodology that we use to train adults okay so so you went from point so you started with pointers yes and so just not that we're going to make a how-to video out of this, but what's the real, the real difference in, in hunting? Because you have pointers, you have dogs that, that, that point the birds, and then you have dogs that retrieve the, the birds, which obviously are the retrievers. What, what's the primary difference in those two dogs, except for the fact that they do two different things? Uh, for me, I think it's a lot of, and this is my opinion, mm -hmm. it's pointers are more independent top breeds. So they are hunting and finding the birds for the hunter to, to mm -hmm. put in front of them, but um, they're doing it for their self gratification of finding the bird. In my opinion, as a lab is more of a biddable breed there. It's like teamwork. So they do enjoy the, the retrieves for the handler, but the training and the actual hunting is more of a team to me. Okay. Um, and for me, that was the biggest difference. Hmm. And is the training, I mean, so obviously, so the, the two dogs are very different in their breedings, in their, in their constitutions. One works more independently where the lab is looking for more directions, like you cast the dog, you, you, you send the dog. So the pointers correct. just kind of go out and find the birds on their own. Yeah, correct. So hmm. they, you know, pointers go out, find the birds on their own, hold the point, the hunter comes up, and they present the bird in front of the hunter. Then for labs, you know, to me, it's more hands-on with the training. Mm -hmm. Um you're teaching them to be sent out for the retrieve, stop to whistles, take casts. Uh, you know, the idea is for a lab to be able to mark and pick everything up without as much help, mm -hmm. but you can train the dog to handle the help from the handler and become that team. And pointers work independently. We don't send them to a specific area. They just go do their own thing. Correct. Correct. You kind of cut them loose and through either training or just the genetics of the dog, they know how to work the cover and work the field or work the wooded area that you're hunting. In. I see. Let's talk about that for a second. Cause I think it's a really important aspect. I talk about it a lot is solid breeding. And I've seen this in dogs like goofy and, and obviously like Dwayne, who's an amazingly well-bred dog. Um, how much of it, when we're talking about dogs, because now we're talking about really high-end competition dogs that are, that are amazingly well-bred, aside from very good training, where do you put the importance of breeding versus training or the combination of breeding versus training in a dog that you're looking at? Probably 70, 30, 70% breeding, 30% training. Wow. Now, my 
opinion of that is, yeah, you can train any dog to do anything, of course. Right. But the more man-made behavior we put in the dog, the more we're covering up what should be natural to them. Mm. Um, I'm a very, very firm believer in that. And that's, so if you take your research and your genetics of the dog and you really pay attention to it, the 30% of the training becomes somewhat easy, as we say it, mm. uh, because their natural tendencies are there. Mm. And I feel like you're preserving the breed when you do that. You're, you're bettering the breed. You're continuing what they've been designed a hundred years, years ago to do is, is, you know, have these natural instincts that we're using for the specific style of hunt we're doing. And does that get better and better with breeding? So in other words, over a hundred years, we've developed these great dogs. Do we, do you think like in, in 120 years or like 20 more years that those dogs are better than what we have today, that ours are Absolutely. better than what they, you do? Absolutely. I've seen a difference in labs just in my 20 year career so far of what we used to deal with versus what we're seeing today. Give me an example uh, of that. Uh, my best example is Boykin Spaniels. Uh, you know, I've trained a lot of those over the years and several years ago they used to be controlled by the boykin spaniel society which was a great thing mm -hmm. um they were dogs that were more uh what i call one person dogs mm -hmm. and now that they've gotten a little bit more popular people are paying more attention to their breedings uh and what the dogs actually being used for we're seeing more trainable dogs today than we did 10 years ago mm -hmm. uh with labs uh we are seeing uh, more trainable dogs, you know, their people are paying attention more to the genetics. Uh, of course, we got all our kind of computer programs that we can use for CLI percentages and tracking. Mm -hmm. I think tracking today is a lot better than it used to be from the genetical test to what each parent was actually producing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's why it's gotten better. Such so dogs that used to mark well, but not handle well, you know, people were paying attention to what they were having to put into the dog to get it to do certain skill sets mm -hmm. and what was actually natural. And so some breeders started breeding more for those natural traits and that made the dog better today, I think. And how much of that carries over from the, the mother and the father you know, over because a lot of times I see dogs, especially in, in IPO, we'll see a female that's just a really nice dog, but the male will be a um, a champion. Is that similar with 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 labs and hunting dogs? It is. Um, I've always looked at it as you have two types of breeders: uh, the ones that put a lot of the emphasis of what the pups are going to get from the mom, mm -hmm. and a lot of the confirmation color comes from the sire. For me, I've been more of putting just as much weight in my male as I do the female when we're looking and trying to put together our breeds because there's a consistency that you see with both parents if you track the previous litters um, that we can see and try to produce the best pups that we can. Mm -hmm. uh, but I still think, you know, a lot of the confirmation, a lot of the color does come strictly from the male and then your mom and your female is kind of putting off the smarts of the dog, the trainability of the dog, things like that. You're saying that comes from the female, the trainability, the bitability and all that? I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's it. So let, look at this for a second. You started, you hunted with your dad. That's how you got started in it. And when you went out for those hunts, those dogs obviously weren't the kind of caliber of dogs that you're training breeding and selling now right yes correct is that there's a big difference there is a big difference right so some some guy who goes out hunting with his son or with his dad or whatever is going to have just a it's a lab he's going to go get the bird he's going to bring it back he may drop it or your feet he may drop it 10 feet in front of you correct so what that's a lot of what we've seen right so what what differentiates that like how do we look and say okay well you know, we want the dog that's going to deliver it this way and he's going to do X, Y, and Z. What differentiates that from those dogs? Is it breeding? Is it training? Is it just the handling? I think that's a little bit of both. Um, you know, I, I can remember <laughs> uh, hunting with my grandfather and my dad when I was younger, you know, and a lot of uh, swearing and cussing and getting mad at dogs. <laughs> so, right. 
you know, I think that's taking that into effect of what you're breeding and training for your next generation to where it's supposed to be enjoyable. Hunting's supposed to be fun. Uh, the day's supposed to be fun. So I think looking at both the genetics and the training programs that you're putting these dogs through mm -hmm. is a big factor. You know, you look at what didn't go well over the last couple of years and what you want to change. Right. And so when you and really really kind of evaluate your training program, your genetics and all that. So and I'm, I'm just bouncing around on this because this is just a super fun conversation I'm having with you. Um, so when you went out hunting, you took, you took a pointer with you or did you take a pointer in a lab? Uh, growing up, it was just pointers. So they would just mark the birds. Yeah. A lot of them didn't retrieve as well. Mm -hmm. So they would just mark the bird, uh, after the bird was taken then we kind of walked and picked up the bird. They were, mm -hmm. after the point uh, and the shot, the bird dogs would leave and go to find the next bird. See, I see, um, I see, I see. And there were a few growing up that I can remember that were good retrieving dogs. Uh, but then again, you're back then you were looking at uh, setters and pointers and German short hairs that were not bred to retrieve. Uh, so that would be something that I think has changed since then till now is, you know, hunters, especially bird dog guys, you know, wanted their bird dogs to retrieve. So they started looking at that and breeding for a retrieving pointer or a retrieving setter or a retrieving German short hair. So, so real quick, in a nutshell, again, I'm, I don't want this to be a how-to video. We can do one of those another point. But um, so there's labs, there's pointers, there's setters, there's um, spaniels. W what do all these different breeds do what do they bring to the table for somebody who's who's hunting so pointers are dogs that can find the bird their nose are extremely keen on finding birds from singles to coveys things like that spaniels and retrievers are more of what we call upland and retriever dogs so they quarter and flush i wouldn't say that their nose is as keen as a pointer mm -hmm. As far as holding the bird till you get close enough for the shot, uh, spaniels are more of a quarter flush type dog that stay in front of the hunter and you just work an area. Mm -hmm. um, they use their nose, get close, somewhat close to the bird and then push it up. Um, you know, a lot of your pointers are what we call big running dogs, so they can cover a lot of ground really fast. Uh, as a quartering dog is only going to cover within 100, 200 yards of the actual hunter. Interesting. So do people, now you do big hunts, right? So you do like, like big events and you'll take, what, what do you take with you on, on a hunt? What, what breeds of dogs? Both pointers and labs. So we'll use the pointers to find the birds and then the labs to flush them up for the hunters to shoot. Uh, so it's kind of a combination of working with the pointers and, and the labs. Um, and then sometimes on just our duck hunts and stuff, we're only going to have retrievers there, Labrador retrievers. Interesting. So one thing I want to kind of touch on in this segment is um, your daughter, Hannah. You know, I've, as strange as, as the dog world is so small, people have yes. come to me and said, what an amazing trainer this Hannah Crisco is. And, you know, they just love her style and everything like that. I said, well, she's got to have good style. I know her dad. Um, how did Hannah get into this? Or was it something she brought to the table? Like, dad, I want to be a hunter, a dog trainer. Or is it something you said, listen, this is what you're going to do for a living. We're carrying yeah. this on <laughs> forever. No, I never really pushed it on her. I think it was just her being raised in it, kind of like I was with my dad and grandfather. And her watching me train dogs as she grew up, walking around with me as I was working with them. And it just kind of started that fire for her, um, you know, with considering it's actually four generations now between my grandfather, my dad, me, and then her. Uh, it's just kind of that family passion. That's how she kind of got started with it. So your grandfather and father were actually dog trainers as well? Yes. Oh, I yes. didn't know that. Okay, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So four generations, that's a, that's a huge, huge legacy. Yes. Yeah, and that's back in late 50s to probably mid 70s is when my grandfather was professionally training that was nowhere near to the level of what you see today uh, back then it was more of your local doctors lawyers mm -hmm. people who wanted dogs that he was working for mm -hmm. 
uh, more of a, I would consider more of a hobby type professional back then mm -hmm. uh, to now where we're full-time training facility and have been for the last 16 years. And that, now we're talking about Whistling Winds, which is in, in Alabama. Yes, yes, correct. Okay, and, and there you train I every different kind of dog. I'm going to talk about that in a second as well. But um, yes. any, anything somebody wants for hunting, you will provide, breed, finish, or train. Yeah, yeah. Now, more of the training. Uh, we only offer or breed Labrador Retrievers through Whistling Wings, but and that is extremely small as far as the breedings that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, more of the training aspect is what we do at Whistling Wings. Got it. So, you know, we, we talked a lot about the difference of um, the dogs, how they've evolved and how the training has evolved. And I think, you know, as we, as we breed better dogs and, and, and train more and, and, and refine things more, we're going to just have better and better dogs. And I think we're doing a service for dogs in that, don't you? Yes. Much better service, too. And so let's talk a little bit about your accomplishments and stuff like that. You know, you've, what are the titles, the different titles that are in hunting um, that you've achieved? I know you've done, I, I looked you up online. I mean, you're my friend and I, I feel bad asking you, but you've got three HRCHs and 15 Master Hunter titles. Yes. So we have a, two different venues that we run hunt tests with. Uh, through the AKC hunt test, which is going to be like your junior, senior, master titles, right. to the UKC hunt test, which are going to be like started season and finished. Mm -hmm. um, when we kind of got started, we run a lot of the UKC events. Uh, and then the more that we got into it, the more we started running the AKC events. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of difference between the two, but they're still somewhat the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and just for me, it's been a little bit more fun running the AKC hunt test part. Uh, but I feel like it helps us with our breeding, mm -hmm. uh, what we're taking into consideration when we're putting two dogs together. Um, it's a good way to challenge the dog. I think more importantly, it's, you know, we talk about, you know, obtaining titles and doing these great things with our dogs. But what it really boils down to for us is the owner and their dog and creating that relationship for them where they can enjoy the day in the field hunting. But then when it's not hunting season, they have something they can go do that keeps them active, keeps them out of the house, doing something with the dog. Right. So the difference between the, the British style, let's talk two different parts. One is the difference in the training and the way these dogs are tested and perform in the British way. And the other side of the overall conformation of the dogs. And uh, people, I don't think, know it, but if you look at a lab at an <clears throat> AKC dog show, they're just kind of like these fat couch potatoes, right? Yes. But, <laughs> and, and again, German Shepherds, uh, all these dogs that I see in show dogs, they might be really nice dogs, but I don't think they're really built or bred to really perform the things they were originally meant to do, whether it's a German Shepherd Correct. or a lab or anything. Um, the difference in let's let's talk about the confirmation of these British labs and American field labs or, or hunt labs. Okay, I mean, the, for me, in my opinion, of the difference is what is run in the field trial and the hunt test. Okay. So that being said, what the type of field trials that we are running over in the UK with these dogs with the British dog is different they're just asking different things of their dogs versus what is asked of the dog here in the states with field trials and hunt tests so tell me the difference um, what is that different um the biggest part of it is in england ireland and scotland the trial is run on an actual hunt okay so it's not something that's predetermined where you have guys out in the field throwing birds uh, mm. This is run on a hunt, so your dog may get a 20-yard retrieve, or it may get the opportunity to make a 300-yard fly. So it's not predetermined um, in, in in the British test. So it could be a much it could be much easier for my dog than for your dog. It could be. Oh wow! Now it doesn't necessarily mean that easy retrieve is going to get you the win. Right? No, I know. Because they're <laughs> <laughs> they're right. still judging dog to dog in the field trial overseas. Okay. 
Um, so you really want to get the hard, long retrieve to win for the day. Mm -hmm. uh, as to where here in the States, um, the hunt test game is more of a standard, mm -hmm. a set standard by the judge. And as long as your dog does what the judge has set for the day, you pass, you get a ribbon, you get titles over a period of time. Got now, the field trial game in the States, uh, the dogs are still judge dog to dog but the setup is the same for every dog right uh because it's a predetermined test that you're running you know you've got your guys sitting out there shooting a gun throwing a bird and every dog gets the same retrieve right so so when we look at this in 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 tr training for this let's start with the training part of it is what do we really need to look at in that basic training to have a dog that'll give us a, a basic entry level thing. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a lawyer. I want to go hunting on the weekends and um, I want a dog. What, what, what's the basic thing I'm looking for to train into my dog to be able to get a junior hunter or something like that? I think obedience. Mm -hmm. So that's I what I got to train into him. You're saying because his natural breeding is going to have the retrieving in him already. Correct. Correct. I think um, the obedience is the main factor. You've got to have a dog that can focus and listen and pay attention. If they're so wound up, so driven to do something, but can't focus enough to learn what to do, that's a big factor in, in especially the novice person wanting to get into this. Mm -hmm. You want to really look at what kind of dog you're buying from what breeding. Okay. So mm -hmm. if I'm wanting to take Sunday drives and enjoy my day, I don't go buy a Ferrari to do that with. <laughs> um, some do. <laughs> yeah, some do. Um, <laughs> just like if I'm wanting to race high end cars, I don't go get a Chevrolet Camaro. I'm going to look at the Ferrari, you know, right. so there, there, it's about picking the right breed, the right genetics, the right lab for what you're doing. If you're going to be running big competitive stuff in the States, mm -hmm. then you need to look at your American bred Labrador uh, to be able to compete well with that. Versus if you're a hunter, strictly a hunter, want a nice calm dog that you can enjoy in the house or at the office, but then also have a stylish dog in the field, then that's when you would look more to the British style Labrador retriever. And that's because that is how they're breeding their dogs for so many generations over there. Mm -hmm. um, it's all about the hunt mm -hmm. um, as to where here in the States, it's got more about the competitive side and they've gotten away from the natural hunting instinct in a way. Mm. So you so the British style dogs, I mean, what, what I've seen is, 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 and tell me, please, is this true? The American style dogs are more kennel. They come out, they work, and then they're kind of kenneled again. And the British style dogs are kind of actually more of a gentleman's gun dog and or a gentlewoman's gun dog or whatever. And they live in the house. They're they're easy, and then they're more refined in the hunting. Is that at all accurate or moderately accurate? Yes, I think it's very accurate. Um, I do think the hunt test game in the states with the American dogs has the hunting aspect involved with it. Mm -hmm. But as with anything, you can't have too much of one thing. So right. you can't have too much of hunting uh, and expect to do good in hunt tests, just like you can't have too much of the hunt test and forget about what the dog was bred to do because then you love you lose more of natural hunting ability with the dog. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. So in looking at this for, from, a, from a competitive aspect, again, there's different things. There's... there's um, waterfowl training and, and this is something i know that you do a lot of the, the sport dog training the waterfowl training and hunt test training we talked a lot about the hunt test training what is upland bird training what is waterfowl training what is sport dog training how do you kind of classify those um into what a person needs to train a dog or to have a, a well-bred and well-trained dog um so of course waterfowl is strictly duck hunting mm -hmm. Uh, so in the training programs, we're going to work more with lining both open water and land. Uh, we're going to teach the dogs to hold that line at longer distances. Um, and then what differs for upland hunting is we need close dogs. So we need dogs that are staying within 
50, 60 yards of quartering and handling because, you know, if they're 200 yards out pushing a bird up, you're not going to be able to shoot the bird. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a lot more close in work um, and not as much lining on water. Uh, a lot of our upland hunters who are out in the West, you know, they do what we call pothole type hunting, which is just small ponds that they're mm -hmm. hunting on. So the dog don't necessarily need the skill set of holding the line through a long, big piece of open water. Um, and then for sport dog training, that is more of somebody that might do a little bit of dove hunting, but they do a lot more outdoor skill sets of uh, camping, hiking, uh, riding mountain bikes, things mm -hmm. like that. And we train these dogs to be able to go out on a daily adventure with them and be obedient and do that, you know, event for the day, whether it's, you know, mountain bike riding where the dog will heal the side of mountain bike. Oh, wow. as they go on this trail um canoeing you know the dog will sit nice and steady in a canoe as they run down the river fishing wow. uh, things like that so that's actually that's actually something that somebody could get a dog for so i could say i just want to go mountain biking with my dog i want to go canoeing with my dog and you can provide a dog for them that kind of has that basic skill set correct wow well, that's a, i know i had no idea i thought this was much much different that's so anybody could get a dog and take them to uh to any activity they really want to do correct correct cool. and we see uh at whistling wing we've got what we call our outdoor adventure dog program uh and we see a lot of different breeds from chassis to labs to spaniels to rescue dogs mm -hmm. uh healers uh different types of breeds of dogs that come through and go through that program and it's people that are outdoor people but they're not hunters right, right um and so again it brings back to that thing of training that dog to a point where the dog and his owner can enjoy the day be outside more spend more time with the dog that's how i feel like we are offering better lives for these dogs whether they're a rescue or mm -hmm. they're a purebred we put them through these programs that make them more enjoyable for the owners to enjoy them mm -hmm. uh and get them outside doing something. What a great thing. I had no idea. That's so, so cool. How long does it take on the average to say, I, I have a dog or, you know, so you're saying if, if I have a dog and I want to train it for the outdoor adventure training, how long does it go to you before it comes back relatively well trained? Uh, about a three to four month training program. Wow. So if we are lucky enough that we get access to the people as they either rescue the dog mm -hmm. or get the puppy. We start the relationship. Then we have them come by, see our facilities, talk to us and, and give them things they work on from the beginning that get them ready for the program. Mm -hmm. um, as we call setting the dog up for success. If they go through that with us then it's about a three month program of getting the dog through all the different skill sets and as we're training the dog i've always called it training the dogs the easy part mm -hmm. um it's training the owners to do what we've taught them to do right uh, that we spend a lot of time with the owner showing them what their dog's learning how to utilize it how to praise for it how to correct for it how to make that relationship successful when the dog comes out of the program right and then if somebody wants a dog that's already trained to, let's say they've already got a junior hunter, some, a, a dog they can hunt with and compete with, how long does that program take for you to get the dog kind of into pocket? Um, that is a little bit longer of a program. So for like our hunt test, our competitive dogs, you're looking at eight to 10 months. Oh, wow. Um, that the dog is with us uh, and the owner is coming in. And about five to six months in, we start running – the hunt test with the dog with the owner training the owner how to handle those tests just like the dog mm -hmm. very cool i mean i like your method of training too I've, I've, we've worked together you know on, with Dwayne and stuff like that what what's your overall uh, again i mean i think people who train really well i had oscar mora on ipo trainer uh you and i we, i think we all kind of see eye to eye there's no real conflict between it how do you explain it to people like uh, you know what your philosophy is on training like how do you approach it? I think it's, I try to explain it as more of a positive approach. Um, pack mentality mm -hmm. of how these dogs communicate and understand. So we spend our time and our research in the genetics of the dog, uh, labs in general. So we want a natural retrieve. We want dogs with natural mouth habits. Uh, if we've done our 
due diligence on the genetics, then the next part is understanding how they communicate because they're not human. Um, and, and taking that into consideration when we're developing the drills that we use to teach the dog. So back when I got started, uh, picked up my first dog, Lacey, and I was in the Navy. The first two books that I picked up and read, one was by a gentleman named Robert Milner, uh, who was kind of the pioneer for importing Labrador retrievers for hunting dogs back in the 80s. Um, and he wrote a book that talked about the new methodology he had picked up from the guys over in England. And a lot of their methodology is built off what naturally the dog should want to do. You shouldn't be forcing anything into the dog. Mm -hmm. um, so after reading that book and then another one by Vic Barlow, uh, who's another Englishman uh, that had wrote a book called British Training for American Retrievers, that's what set the pace for me for my dog experience. And I can remember my grandfather bringing up pointers and German short hairs and stuff like that and talking about the dogs that he really had to put a lot of pressure on to get them to do on the hunt what he needed. Those were the dogs he, he would get rid of. He would rehome them to someone that just wanted a pet mm -hmm. because the, it's in the genetics. They should want to do certain things. And right. so that being brought up that way and then being exposed to the UK methods is just, and I've, tried to explain it the best I can, but all I know to say is that that's what's inside of me. It's hard for me to understand that I have to force a method on a dog to get it to do something it should want to love to do, uh, from handling to retrieving and things like that. I, 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 I think that's so great. L let's talk about that for a second. So the dog should have a natural desire to whatever it is, whatever the dog is bred to do, naturally retrieve, naturally, you know, protect or naturally whatever. But does that mean there's no corrections involved? Does that mean there's no building structure involved? No, there's correction. There's definitely building structure because I'm a firm believer in dogs have to understand consequence. They have to know what happens when they don't do something because that's what happens to them in the wild. Right. Um, so by going completely positive, I think you're opening up a no an, another can of worms with <laughs> what your dog is, isn't and isn't going to do and respect you as a leader. So they have to understand the consequence. For us, it's all with a slip lead. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we use slip leads for corrections. When teaching heel or sit whistle or things like that, um, we use voice, our energy as I'm sure everybody's heard the energy that we portray to the dog uh, versus tone infliction of me being pleased and displeased. Mm -hmm. And we work it at such a close range with the dog starting out that by the time we start edging out where the dog is 100 yards from us, 200 yards from us, it's so consistent for the dog. He doesn't question it because we've worked on that leadership that control at such a close range that when we start edging them out they listen just the same is that hard for people who let's say do some you know that they're accountants for a living and then you're suddenly telling them you have to have this kind of energy for praise this kind of energy for corrections and this do people have a hard time manifesting that persona to get the dog to understand this is a correction this is a, a ple where i'm pleased with you they do <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I think the reason people nowadays struggle with it so much and I, I use this term a lot it's the American way of bigger better and faster mm -hmm. uh, you, yeah. some sometimes we don't need to be trying to reinvent the wheel there's mm -hmm. no way of reinventing a wheel a wheel is a wheel so um, it's I think it's more of the push button effect that we come you know, social media, everything is instant nowadays. Mm -hmm. And what happens that becomes so constant for everyone through their everyday life that when it comes to dog training, they expect the same thing. Yeah. Um, and that causes problems for the dog, not us. Right. Um, well, confusion, right? Yes. Confusion. And it's hard for people to understand. Um, I think the other thing that we see a lot of, we deal with a lot of business owners, uh, doctors and lawyers who are 
so in control during the day mm -hmm. with their daily routine that when it comes to the dog, they want to let go. And the problem with that is you can't. You have to be just as a good of a leader for your dog as you do your business and your employees. Uh, and that's really hard to get people to understand. That's really interesting you said that because I would have just thought the opposite. Like they want to let you, you're saying they want to let go when it comes to the dog. And you, you're saying they actually just want the dog to naturally get it. Is that what you're saying? Correct. I oh. think that's more, yeah, I think they want the dog to naturally, they should naturally get it because they've been bred to get it. Right. Um, or I spent a lot of money a true, for it. Correct. Exactly. <laughs> um, you know, and that, and the other thing is they are so stressed, so in control, so doing, doing, their job during the day that when they come home they don't want to have to do that with the dog. Mm. Um, but then they've bought such a high energy, high, high bred dog that it needs it. They mm. need it just like the employees need it through the day. Yeah. And how, do, what's the best way that people can learn to, un cause I, that's a question I get all the time. What's your answer? Like, how do you tell people, Hey, follow X, Y, and cause dog training. I mean, I don't know if what your principle is. I just think it's like so easy. I think it's so I can't yeah. believe people need somebody to help them do it. It's just a matter <laughs> of communicating. What's your answer? Like, what do you tell people? I try to explain the dog mentality in a nutshell. So the pack mentality. So mm -hmm. I try to explain to people that these dogs are domesticated. So they're not what I would consider a true pack animal. Right. But that's the way they communicate. That's the way they're mentally wired. So they have to have leadership. Dogs need jobs. Mm -hmm. um, when they don't have jobs, that's when they do dysfunctional things, as we call it. Uh, and that job could be sitting on a bed, retrieving a duck, finding a bird, finding drugs for police guys, you know, mm -hmm. all kinds of different jobs for the dogs. Um, so we try to explain it that way. Um, there's another book that I recommend to everyone that's really good. It's called Leader of the Pack by Steve Duno and Nancy um, that talks about the pack mentality of visuals. So just simple visuals that a dog begins to understand that the human is the leader is when you're sitting on your couch watching TV, the dog is sitting on the floor, mm -hmm. not on the couch with you where yeah. they're at the same level. Mm -hmm. um, going through doorways first. You know, mm -hmm. we teach the dog to sit open a door, you go through the doorway first, and then the dog follows. If you do those things, that dog starts seeing you as a leader mm -hmm. because leaders lead. Mm -hmm. And so we use those kind of talking points to try to explain to people how their dog is viewing them and how important it is to establish that early. Right. If you establish it early and you establish the relationship, then, as we call start off hard first, go soft later. Then right. you can start relaxing and enjoying the dog. Mm -hmm. And it's usually the opposite. People want to enjoy and relax and enjoy the dog without giving them a clear view of who's in control and who's not. Yeah. I mean, I think it's so important that people understand that they're doing this for the dog. Like people yes. think, you know, oh, I'm going to love my dog. I'm going to cuddle my dog and all this stuff. And then when the problems arise, they're almost impossible to fix. Yes. That's when they call us. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's always the problem. So, um, yeah. I mean, the leadership thing is so huge. And I mean, I like the way you talk about it where it's, you know, it's something that they, naturally they see it. They see the leader leading and then they naturally follow. They, I, don't you think that dogs really want to be led just, just instinctually? That's who they are. Abs absolutely. Absolutely. Um, they are looking for a leader from day one. Mm -hmm. They're not, I've always referred to them, they're not natural born leaders. Mm -hmm. um, they are looking for the leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, when they don't see it, that's when they attempt to become one themselves. And uh, they fail at it miserably. Yes, correct, correct. Because this is not their world. Yeah. Uh, this is our world that we've brought them into. So, yes, I agree 100% with them not being natural born leaders and they're constantly looking for that leadership. As long mm -hmm. as we understand it, um, we can enjoy the dog and make them have a better life. All right, Jeremy, so we talked about um, the difference between the English gu gun dogs and, and, the, and the American labs. You, you've recently um, tr trialed in England or Great Britain, I should say, right? Yes, yes. Back uh, this last fall, we ran our first UK field trials in Scotland and Ireland. And what was it like compared to all the work you've done here? Oh, it was great. Um, 
the biggest difference is the steadiness. So over in the UK from seven o'clock in the morning, when we get our dogs out of the car to go to run the trial, that dog comes out of the car and he's off lead and required to be steady and quiet, non-vocal from seven in the morning till five in the afternoon versus a lot of the hunt tests and the trials run here in the States. It's a five minute span Mm -hmm. where you pull the dog out of your vehicle, you put it on lead, you go through your holding blinds to get to the line to run. Mm -hmm. And then for five minutes of your test, that's when he's required to be steady and quiet. So I don't know. I'm, I'm confused. You're saying in England, when you take the, the you check in in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning, your dog, doesn't isn't on a leash he isn't on a lead and he's off that lead for the entire eight to ten hour day so even when other people are event. so <laughs> other people are, are are trialing other people are doing going through their things so you're just standing there with your dog off leash yes so they would rotate you in to take your turn to run for the trial mm-hmm. but as you finish that <clears throat> you would adjust back behind the line 40, 50 yards away. So your dog's required to be steady in the line as you're running. Mm -hmm. And then also as you're outside the line waiting to run again, uh, the requirement is to be steady and quiet, not great, things like that. So the dog would be with you, would hang out with you, (coughs) would would you take a dog over to potty or you'd go eat something or something, but the dog doesn't get put on a leash or put back in a crate or anything like that? Correct. Correct. So it's it's required to be that steady all day long, whether you're running or you're waiting to run. And, and so yeah, they're they're with you from the time you get out of the car to you go back into the car to leave for the day. It's almost unfathomable having seen you know dogs here in the states, and and I'm not slamming the, the trainers here. I'm sure they're doing a great job. What's what's is there a secret to getting a dog to that level of control? Uh, starting from the beginning, teaching, so we have what we call a trail of memory, mm-hmm. uh, which is we walk out with the dog, we pitch them up or out, and we walk them away. And okay. so they start from an earlier age learning that the quiet, the steadiness gets them the reward of the retreat. Okay. So you're taking a, you take the dog out. At, at what age would you start that at? Uh, we started as early as 10 or 12 weeks old. Wow. Um, and with our older dogs that are coming into the training program, you know, it's more of a six to eight month mm-hmm. age, but it's the same thing. It's having them on a lead so that we can control them, mm-hmm. uh, pitching that bumper out, walking them away till we see them get calm, almost forget what we pitched out. And then once they show us the behavior of being quiet and being steady, they're sent for the retreat to reward them. So what we build off of that? What's the correction? <laughs> you walk the dog out, you throw the bumper, the dog starts barking and lunging, wanting to go for it, or then you walk away with and we, you just pop him. Yes, pop him with the lead, tell him no, and walk him away. And we keep kind of walking away from the distraction mm-hmm. until we see the dog get quiet. I see. And so, so, so here's the big question that always comes up with anybody, you know, on dog training per se. Um, you take the dog, you do this, you do it for a month or two. Then finally you get the dog and you throw the bumper and you turn and walk away and then the dog just breaks. Now what do you do? So we catch the dog, make a correction with the lead, put mm-hmm. the lead back on the dog, make the correction, and then we'll kind of uh, desense him to bumpers being thrown out. So mm-hmm. <clears throat> if I've made the move to taking the dog off lead, pitching a bumper out and walking them away, and they break. Um, We try to get to the dog before they get the retreat Mm -hmm. and put the lead on them, make them a correction with the lead, and then we sit them down right then, pitch one out, tell them no, walk them away with the lead, Mm -hmm. take them off lead, and set them up like we're fixing to send them for the retreat. Mm -hmm. But if they give us any kind of flinch or any kind of movement, we walk away again. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we're showing them what they did wrong and then showing them how to fix that in their self in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a fine line to get a dog to that level. How many dogs do you think, let's say, out of 100 dogs, you know, would have that ability? I'm saying well-bred, well-trained dogs have that ability to go to a trial like a real, you know, f- a field trial and do that. Um. 
probably one out of 15 to 20, but wow. teaching them to be steady uh, and quiet, every single dog can learn that. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's patience. Just, correct. It's teaching them patience and memory, and the reward is when they give us the memory and the, the patience and the quiet to get to retrieve. So when you say a trail, usually, sorry, go ahead. Uh, usually dogs that are real wild and very breaky, mm-hmm. within a 15-minute session, I can start getting them to understand to sit and wait. And you, I wouldn't say completely steady, right. but within a 15-minute session, I can get them understanding the basic concepts of what I'm trying to show them. And that's using a, a system of reward and consequence? Yes. Okay. And you you use this term a couple of times because I, I I really like the term, but I kind of want to want you to define what it means. And you're saying this trail of memory. What does that mean? So uh, we take a bumper, uh, which is the retrieve object for the dog, mm-hmm. and imagine a fence line. Uh, we walk to a point on that fence line and pitch that bumper out mm-hmm. right in front of the dog, probably four or five feet. Then we tell them no and walk them away from it down the fence line. Mm -hmm. And then at any point, whether it's 10 yards, 20 yards, 40 yards, or 100 yards, we turn the dog back around facing the retrieve and have them sit, and then we send them for the retrieve. Mm. I see. And do dogs like that are like, like, let's say somebody has a pet, and the dog is always, you know, just is very mouthy or playful and is doing things. How do you, like... It's a, I'm try, trying to figure out how to word this. How do you associate that, hey, you're, you're not allowed to play now without breaking that spirit in the dog to when you're, you're out in the field and this dog needs an incredible amount of drive and determination to go through other things? Okay. Um, so if I have a dog that's not as driven, mm-hmm. We're not going to work on steady from the beginning. We actually want them to break a little point, a little bit and kind of build that drive. Okay. And then as we see the drive is consistent in different environments, then we would start working the steady work. Uh, so it's kind of feeding what is natural to them on the retreat. Right. But do pet dogs, like do people who have them as pets, have a harder time getting the dog to understand like, okay, in the house, you're playing around, you're doing this and you're doing that, but outside in the field, it's more serious. Can you, can, can people draw that line from a pet to a really solid hunting dog? I think so. I think there are are a few of the pet dogs that can be used as hunting dogs and kind of nurture that natural retrieve desire because even with um, rescues to Mm -hmm. purebreds, I've always looked at every dog likes to retrieve because it's the prey drive of the dog. Mm -hmm. Um, And so nurturing that, we can build it into a retrieve. Uh, But I do think the pet dog in itself can distinct between the two because if we're in the yard playing with the dog as exercise for retrieve, we might use a tennis ball. Mm -hmm. And then if we're out in the field hunting, we're retrieving birds or we're retrieving bumpers to teach the dog. So there's that visual change for the dog that they can learn the difference. Um, you, you, I saw a thing online, actually Janet showed it to me, that you did this puppy socialization program at Auburn University. And, yes. and I mean, I always talk about the, the, the critical, critical, critical importance of socializing puppies. I think it's the number, I think it's more important than any training or anything else that a dog does. So you've done this as a, as an ex, as a, as a thesis or experiment or whatever. It's obviously scientific. Tell me about that program and tell me about where those important times lay and the important experiences lay for a dog. So <clears throat> different stages from the time of birth to eight weeks. And so the study was to try to figure out how much the socialization human interaction for young pups was later down the road for them. Mm -hmm. Um, And we had two separate litters. We had one litter that had no interaction other than with the mother. Okay. Uh, No sound, no human interaction, nothing. And then we had our litter in the other room that had daily interaction with humans. What we found is that the dogs were being able to develop uh, certain behaviors that helped them down the road. So the litter that was left alone, when they were eight weeks old, they were coming out and experiencing humans, experiencing the human world and couldn't handle it. They never rebounded from it. 
Wow. Uh, but with the liver that we had, the daily interaction, we started at three days old with exposing them to different textures, sounds, temperature changes uh, from hot and cold to one day being loud, clapping our hands, playing loud music to the next day being very quiet. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of creating the dog to learn how to deal with certain scenarios. So you walk in the room, you smack the hands, the pups run to the back side of the room, but within minutes they were coming forward to check it out. To recover so from the experience. Them. Yes, mm-hmm. correct. To recover from the, the excitement or the scared part of what they were experiencing. And it all was about connecting the synopsis in the brain, kind of kick-starting them to use their brain so that they started training and accepting training at an earlier age. And stimulation uh, and as well. Stimulation, more well-rounded dogs at eight weeks old. Mm-hmm. Uh, during this time and during this study, we also found out, uh, like, for instance, when you want to let pups go home. Some breeders will let them go at six weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for breeders like us, we keep them to eight weeks because i seen during the study, those last two weeks is when these dogs were learning what I call bite inhibition. Mm. And so for a gun dog and having good mouth habits where they're not chewing the game or chewing the bumpers, things like that. So during that time frame, what, what we were seeing happening, the, the litter was interacting with itself and one pup bites another pup. Mm-hmm. Those two pups just learn how hard to bite to make the other one scream. Right. And the other pup don't get bit. Mm-hmm. So they were learning the pressures of their bite inhibition during that stage. So if they're not together as a litter, mm-hmm. guess where that's happening? It's happening at home with the owners. Yep. So we were hearing, my puppy won't stop chewing on me, you know, things like that. So during that study, we learned that to allow those pups two more weeks with the litter to learn things that we can't recreate as humans. Wow. Um, and it, it just in a nutshell, establishing the socialization at an early age helped these dogs be better as they continue to grow from eight weeks to six months of accepting the training and accepting the human work. So, so one thing I always see with shepherds is, and I, and I hear it, you know, that they're 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 nipping the kids or going after bicycles and all this stuff because I think that's just a natural, natural, natural habit. And when when and I've talked about this before with with dogs that aren't exposed to black people or little children or or, or tall tall people wearing hats, you know, um, women, men, you know, people of different ethnicities, all these things. It really dogs have a hard time f- learning that later. And my biggest fear is right. always kids. You know, I think adults right. can kind of handle themselves. What do you, what's your feeling on that, that on how to expose the, the dogs to that and how to make it a positive experience that they can learn from? And that's, <coughs> I agree, it's exposing the dog at an earlier age so they're ready for that. So when we're doing our socialization program with our pups, we're involving everybody that I can mm-hmm. from kids to people that work on the ranch to everyone. And that's so when these dogs go home at eight weeks, it's not something new to them. Mm -hmm. But then we also educate our clients that are getting dogs from us how to continue that after eight weeks because it is a continuous work. So exposing them to little kids, everything from 10-month-olds to 3-year-olds to Mm -hmm. 11-year-olds to the different people sizes, tall, short, yeah. Uh, things like that. Yeah, t- tones and stuff like that. I think it's so important for the dog. I mean, you do a great job. When, when we came down to get Dwayne, I mean, the amount of work and effort and cleanliness and, and everything in your kennel is just top, top, top shelf. And I think it's important people understand you don't get that when you buy the dog off Craigslist or off some fancy website because you don't get to see that. Ex- you only see the picture. Correct. Right? And I mean, now when people get a dog from you, 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 what I've seen, what you've told me, people come down, they meet the parents of the dogs, not your parents, but your parents of the dogs, and they, they meet the other puppies and they see your facility. I mean, how can you stress the importance of that to people listening that they should require that? That should be what they're doing. Correct. You should do your research. You know, you should really do the research on the breeder that you're interested in getting a dog from, that they are doing their health testing. And it, it, it's about a passion. 
uh, your breeders who are really looking at their matings and mm. trying to better the breed that they have, you'll see that. You'll see that from going and visiting their facilities to talking to them and to researching them. And that's what makes the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, seeing that someone, it's not just a business. It's, you know, we're really concerned about the dog and what we're creating and bettering the breed with. Yeah. I mean, I think that's so critical. I mean, and, and it's a service that breeder, you know, people are always, rescue people are always nuts about, oh, breeders are this, breeders are that. And I agree that people who are breeding dogs off Craigslist are that exactly that and probably 10 times worse. But good right. breeders are actually instilling these amazing qualities in dogs that we want to have that with that the, the dogs that we that we've uh, you know learned to love if not we're going to have all these crappy bred dogs yes. what, what would you say because you're a breeder that i respect immensely what are the three qualities that a good breeder or maybe there's more i don't know but what are the top things a person should look for when they're going to get a dog from a good breeder who is a good breeder how do we differentiate i think by notifying that they have good genetics and are health testing the dogs. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's one sign. Can that be proven? Another one, <clears throat> oh, it can. Okay. Uh, but today, especially, there's so many organizations that provide the health testing that are available on the internet that okay. you can find out without even talking to the breeder that they're actually testing their dogs. Mm. Um, I think the other thing, too, is talking to the breeder and knowing that they identify the pros and the cons of their own dog. So yeah. not every dog's perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, they've got their good points, but there are some bad points that they're breeding or bringing to that breeding also. And a breeder that identifies that and talks about it is one that is showing you that they see that that dog has some failures along that way mm -hmm. and with the breeding they're trying to balance that out um I always tell people if you're talking to a breeder that's saying i got this wonderful male and this wonderful female and we're going to have wonderful pups that's the ones you <laughs> want to stay clear of right so, right right uh you want to talk to the ones that say this dog is great with these aspects but this is also what he's not great at right but this female is great at this, but mm -hmm. not this, and we're trying to mix that into the pups that we're producing. Yeah, I said, um, to, I said to Janet the other day, I said, what if like Cindy Crawford and Albert Einstein had a baby? Like, do we really think it would be the most beautiful, smartest person on the planet? Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or just a really ugly, you know, a good person. <laughs> yes, yes. So I think, you know, your genetics, your health testing, uh, the just the issue of that they have identified the pros and cons of each parent mm -hmm. and what they're passing along and just seeing the passion and what they're talking about and their facilities and their dogs, you know, go visit the place. And visit. Yeah. That's the key. Can I go, can I go meet the parents? Can I meet you? Can I see your facility? Cause when they don't do that, that to me is a red flag. Yes. Yeah. If you can't do it, it's a red flag. And then even for us as a breeder, I'm not very big on people getting dogs from us mm -hmm. that don't come visit us. Yeah, see, I love um, I know that. They've done, I know they've done their research on us. I know they've really checked us out, but I really want them to see what they're getting from because mm -hmm. that allows me to make sure they're educated mm -hmm. and make sure they're ready for the dog they're about to get from us. Yeah, I remember one person, I, I, I did this other podcast on breeding, and this person who said, well, you know, I work for a great breeding facility, and we wouldn't let people in because we don't want to bring contaminants into our puppies. And I thought, that's, a, that's actually a brilliant, brilliant way to get people to not visit the place and kind of work around it. You know, it's a great bullshit lie. Correct, correct. Because there's so many, you know, protections we can take to protect the puppies and everything if we're bringing people in. Yes, yes. So and that's, if you're cleaning correctly and really watching what you do, you there's so many more benefits to having people visit. Um, and, and that goes for people visiting. And we have a litter that's on the ground that we're working with. Mm -hmm. We expose that litter to these new people coming in. Yeah, it's a part, um, a part of the socialization. So basically your whole life, you've been, you're, you're a gun dog guy, right? You're a Southern guy. You're, you're yes. rough and tough. You're like the Marlboro man of Alabama. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but let's say, for example, you weren't going to have a Labrador. And I know you love your Labradors and stuff like that. What would be the dog you would want 
to have. My first choice would be a mouth, like good Goofy. Yeah, good choice. So, and it's uh, because of the intensity of those dogs is just very intriguing to me. Um, the different things they can learn, they're intense, they're focused, they're just like really feeding to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, some labs are that way, but some labs are also just happy go lucky, whether they're just hanging out with you or they're learning to retrieve and then go on yeah. the hunt. But you know, if I was going to pick another dog besides a lab, it would be a mile. Okay. Um, then besides that would probably be the Munchlander, okay. um, which is a very cool breed. It's very versatile, very intense about learning. Okay. And it's called a, it's called a Munchlander. Yes. Munchlander. How do you spell that? M U N S T E R. Munchland. And where? What is that? What kind of dog is that? I'm, I hope I'm not the only one asking. So it's uh, very similar to like a German wire hair type dog. Okay. Uh, with a more of a setter type coat, uh, softer hair. Um, they're great all around German based type dogs. Okay. And wh- what do you like about? So so it's still a hunting type dog. Still a hunting dog. Um, very intense about learning, very control on their breeding uh-huh. as far as they're, they're not exposed to the everyday life of the show rings and things like that. Got um, it. So they were very controlled coming out with offering the dogs to people. Um, and I think anytime it's a smaller, a smaller knit group, the, the genetics have stayed really clean. Yeah. Uh, but a very versatile dog trained to shed hunt, blood trail, retrieve game. Uh, it's just dogs that I've worked with over the years. They're some of the, they're up there in those top three. Wow. That's pretty amazing. And, and what do you, you know, people always, I, I personally think a Labrador is probably the best all around dog for the average person. Now, maybe not a, you know, maybe not a field lab or, or a high intensity lab, but they seem to be. What would you say to somebody if they, 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 they've got kids, a guy's a doctor, he works five days a week, his wife is, you know, a model and doesn't work, doesn't do anything except spend his money. But, <laughs> but what, what would you think, <laughs> a, a small family, I want to get a dog for my family, what, what would you recommend I get? A lab. Yeah. I think labs are very forgiving to the busy lifestyle of the human. Yeah. Um, I think that's why they're, you know, one of the popular breeds still today mm-hmm. and a long time running, but a, a lab because yeah. they're so forgiving, so biddable, so happy go lucky top breed. Yeah, they're just a great breed. They're just a really, really nice dog. I mean, I think it's so important that people search out a good breeder. I mean, I'm big on people rescuing dogs, but so many times, you know, I want to hedge my bets. I want to say, okay, you know, I'm going to do competitive obedience or protection or I'm going to do agility or I'm going to do hunting. I really want to hedge my bets and get the best dog I can and, you know, search out a good print, uh, printer, a good breeder and, and get the best dog I can possibly get. So yes. um, if people want to find you and get more information, because I get questions all the time about hunting things and stuff like that. Um, where can we find you on the Internet? Where, you know, give us your, and I'll, I'll put it all in the description down below the video as well. So we, of course, have a website for Whistle and Wings Kennel. It's called uh, theultimatesportingdog.com. Okay. Uh, covers a lot of info on our different training programs and a little bit about what we do and a little bit of history of us. Uh, and then, of course, our social media from our Instagram, Facebook page for Whistle and Wings Kennel. Okay. Uh, but also YouTube. Uh, we have some training videos there uh, talking about our training style. Uh, everything from obedience up to some of the retriever work of teaching the dog to run a trail in memory and teach steady work and things like that. So on your YouTube channel, people could actually learn some techniques on gun dog tra- on training their own dog to do some of this. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And we've got some great steady and steady type videos on there, how we get these dogs steady and quiet with a lot of excitement of shooting or other dogs retreating and things like that. That's great. Okay. So, so, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, you're everywhere. Yes. yes cool. Everywhere. And again, if somebody wants a dog that's already, you know, great for outdoor adventure training or just going out hiking or canoeing or camping, as well as all the way through a finished dog that'll, that'll do field trials or, or hunt test, you're the guy to go to. Yes, correct. Cool. 
Excellent. Jeremy, what a great conversation with you. Um, you know, I mean, I learned so much more about you, even though I've known you for a few years. Um, you're always, always a pleasure to talk to. I love the way you train dogs. I love your passion for dogs, and um, I really respect you a great deal. So I hope people enjoyed this podcast as much as I enjoyed doing it. I'm, I'd like to have an open invitation to have you back on and do another one of these because um, I, I just think people should, you know, I think great dog trainers and stuff like that should be out there. And uh, again, I love you. I respect you. And, uh, and, uh, and Dwayne loves you. And we love Dwayne Amater more than anything. Good, good. So good. Um, guys tune in, um, every, every Thursday, a new podcast comes up on YouTube. It's up on Saturdays. I uh, hope to see you soon. Make sure you check out the, my website as well, Robert Cabral. I'll put all the links for Jeremy of Whistling Wings, uh, kennels in the YouTube video description down below. If not, um, you can get it off YouTube when the video hits there and I'll see you next week.